All right. Good afternoon, everybody. Again. Good afternoon again. There, uh, I know when we do the recording and stuff, I get up here and I uh, say that we've been through the prayer request, and I don't oft, always, maybe I should, uh, announce the prayer request and make them public so that everybody out there knows who they're praying for. And even you, you, I've done it a couple times here before we have the recording to let you in the room. In case you didn't hear all the prayer requests, you know who you're praying for. But there was a couple of things on there that I do want to mention, and I should have maybe even before we got started. But uh, one of the praises on there is today happens to be my mom and dad's 67th wedding anniversary. So that is a, uh, that's, that's an accomplishment. My dad's really been through it. No, I'm just kidding. It's, uh, that's a good, I know, this is a, a happy occasion that they've, their marriage has uh, survived the years. And it's also great to have Coach Wilkes back in the room with us. Now we just got to get him back to the, back to the podium. So praises, a lot of, there was several praises in the prayer request today, and that's, uh, that's a good thing. So it's good to be here again. Um, I'm glad I didn't wear a jacket because it is warm up here. <laughs> um, I remember Ron White. That wasn't, it's, it's got to be comfortable for everybody else. Don't worry about me. Um, and I wouldn't, I don't, uh, I don't endorse his comedy by any stretch of the imagination because it kind of, kind of got a little rough after he was at it a while. But I remember him saying uh, <laughs> a couple of things about being arrested outside of a bar, getting kicked out of a bar, and talking about the cops showing up and and uh, I don't know how many they I don't know how many they had but I know how many they were going to use uh, to arrest him but he also said I had the right to remain silent but I didn't have the ability um, so today I guess I have the right since it's just me to take a couple hours of your time right I don't have the ability um, I, well I don't say that I probably could ramble for a couple of hours but you'd all be asleep by then so it may not be a uh, May not be a very long service, but that's okay. We can make it long with the fellowship and the breaking of bread and that kind of thing. So, um, as you may or may not recall, uh, last week we had a had a round table or a square table or a rectangle table, whatever you want to call it, Bible study discussion back there. And I think overall it went well. Um, got some positive comments. I know that not all questions were answered, and I didn't expect them to be, and I don't know that we ever could answer all the questions, but one of the things that was mentioned was tough love. Um, it wasn't all about tough love, or maybe it was because love can be tough, right? Love can be painful, love can be hard, difficult. Not always simple, by no stretch of the imagination, but I do know there was one or two people that mentioned in just in conversation or in discussion about administering tough love, and sometimes that's what it's called. That's, it's, it's, uh, things that you have to do maybe for the person's own good or you know that it's for the benefit of the person or the, the group, whatever it happens to be. Um, but tough love is not a new concept to us. Maybe we have a little bit of difference of understanding of how it works or what it is. I don't know. But when you mention things like tough love, sometimes there can be a, uh, a little bit of a recoil, um, me included. And I don't know that even the first time it was mentioned last week that it didn't make me have some, some kind of, of feeling. Um, tough love. Because, you know, because you, can, you could say, oh, that's the hands-off kind. Tough love is when you're, you know, and, and some people might say that. Well, you're just, it's a cop-out. That's a hands-off kind of love. You don't, it's, it's simpler. You're not really doing anything, just letting things take their course. Tough love, right? It's when you just don't feel like being involved. You just don't feel like being involved. You just, you know, administer some, some tough love. Um, but then during the week, not, not digging through the word, I guess, but in, in, in my thought processes, thinking about the Bible study or maybe even the next Bible study, um, which Chris may be leading so he can, he can be the judge of that, but trying to find examples, when you think about, a term like tough love, and me going through my Rolodex and trying to think of examples in the Word where Jesus administered tough love. Is that there? Is it there? Is there? Are there examples in here of Jesus administering tough love where he says, you know, sorry, you're just going to have to figure this out. 
I can't help you. Yeah, I realize you got a problem, but you're just going to have to figure it out. I don't want to get involved. Simpler. It's hands off. You just you do what you got to do. You're just going to have to figure it out. In Luke chapter 8, and, and, and thinking about those things, I don't know that any time during the week I came up with, oh, yeah, here's, here's a, uh, there's an example of Jesus administering tough love. But I did go to this scripture this morning in Luke chapter 8. And I would tell you how I ended up there, but I'm not sure I really know. But in Luke chapter 8, in verse 23, Luke chapter 8 and verse 23, as they sailed. Well, let's, let's back up one more verse. Luke 8, 22, one day Jesus said to his disciples, let us go over to the other side of the lake. So they got into a boat and set out. As they sailed, he fell asleep. A squall came down on the lake so that the boat was being swamped. And they were in great danger. The disciples went and woke him saying, Master, Master, we're going to drown. He got up and rebuked the wind and the raging waters. The storm subsided and all was calm. Where is your faith, he asked his disciples. In fear and amazement, they asked one another, who is this that he commands the winds and the water? And they obey him. Familiar story, right? Familiar details, familiar surroundings. According to this story, you... It's not the, obviously not the first time you've heard this story. The question, I guess, is how, how do you think this scene would look different? How do you think this scene that we just read would look different if seen through a tough love filter? If you were looking at everything from a tough love standpoint, um, how would this scene look? Because it says he fell asleep. That's the first thing for me. He fell asleep. Now, it's hard for me to imagine that Jesus was more tired than anyone else on this boat. Because if you read in Luke 8 leading up to them getting on this boat and, and, and leaving, they had been in the crowds, it says. You know, it's the time when there were so many people Somebody came to him and said, your, your, your mother and your brothers are outside wanting to see you. And he asked the question, well, who are, who are your mother and your brothers? These people here are your, your brothers and sisters and mother and so forth and so on. And, and he gives the parable. It's one of the times when he gave the parable of the sower. So there's been crowds of people that talks about him coming from town after town. So I imagine that Jesus wasn't the only tired person because we've, we've heard a lot that Jesus was the son of a carpenter, helped his, helped, helped his dad, learned to be a carpenter, probably in pretty good shape, right? I don't think Jesus was the, the feeblest one of the bunch. And he was tired, tired enough that he fell asleep in this boat, right? But it's hard, again, for me to imagine that he was more tired than anyone else. It doesn't say he alone fell asleep. So how do we know that several of them weren't asleep before, before, the, before the drama unfolds, right? So, no matter, even if more of them than him had fell asleep, there is some obvious differences. Now, if you read this scripture, and the way it's, at least the way it's written, the way it's translated here, and the punctuation that it has, it doesn't seem as though this is somebody coming to him and going, hey, we're in a little bit of trouble here. We, we might be going to drown. It's, master, master. We're going to drown. He wakes up and does what he has to do, right? So this, is, this isn't calmness. You know, master, master, that conveys drama. So let's pretend or let's imagine that he's not the only one asleep in the boat before the chaos breaks out. Why had this threat or this danger not awakened him already? The squall came down. He's asleep in the boat. They have to go wake him up and say, we're, we're, you got to do something. We're going to drown. It, hadn't, it had not awakened him. You know, the, the dictionary tells us that benevolence is a desire to do kindness. 
It's not a word we use a lot. I don't, I go many, many days at a time without using the term benevolence, right? It's maybe a desire to do kindness. Maybe we talk about kindness or, you know, the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak, that kind of stuff. We don't, benevolence is just not a, an overused word by any stretch of the imagination, but benevolence means to have a desire to do kindness. Now, I don't know how many people in here are like me, and I guess it depends on the day or the night, whatever it happens to be, but is having, is having a highly excited person shake you awake a good way for them to experience your benevolent side? Probably not. Freddie, Freddie! What, 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 what are you doing? Well, I said it depends on the day, right? Or the night. But I don't think that having some highly excited person shake you awake is the best way to experience your benevolent side. I don't know how the scene might have looked different through a, through a tough love filter, but reading this scenario, it seems like it might have been a, a good opportunity, <laughs> a good opportunity to, to, for some tough love. His action, though, of course, explains the lack of alarm. That last sentence of verse 24 he got up and he rebuked the wind and the raging waters. The storm subsided and all was calm. Does this help explain why this threat, this alarm that they all felt hadn't awakened him? Because the solution was simple, wasn't it? Oh, no problem. Not that he had that kind of attitude. But he got up. And this is Luke's recording. How do we know exactly how everything unfolded? Who was asleep? Who wasn't? You know, this is, this is Luke's writing. Uh, and maybe, maybe Luke embellishes a little bit when he says raging water. <laughs> he rebuked the wind and the raging waters. Maybe it is his embellishment. Who, who can say? I remember, as I was reading this, it came to my mind, actually. I remember a Feast of Tabernacles. I cannot tell you what year. I do know that it was, at, I'm 99% I'm sure it was at Myrtle Beach, and it was a good while back, because if I'm not mistaken, because I was imagining the scenario, the room that we were in for services, and there was a whole bank of windows down one side of the meeting, meeting hall, so I think it was when they were having the feast at Spring Maid. I don't know that. I never stayed at Spring Maid, but I remember having, I remember going there for services, and I remember sitting there, <clears throat> I don't know if it was the middle, end of the feast, I know there had been some, some forecast of some, some dangerous weather, maybe. But I remember sitting there during the services and looking out at the Atlantic Ocean, and it was upset, to say the least. I mean, it was very turbulent, and very not, not to a scary point, but it's a, a, an, an unsettled sea is quite menacing, isn't it? If you were sitting on a, <clears throat> a big rock, somewhere close to the water, maybe not right at the water. You know those places where the, where the waves come up and crash against the rocks and makes this big, you know, it's, uh, and if it got really, that's during a normal sea. But when the sea gets upset or unsettled and it's, and it's choppy and it's, you know, it's the rocking because you think, man, I would not want to be out there. But it is just looking at it. It's, it's quite menacing. So, um, having that in my mind, when you could walk out, when you could walk out on the, on, the, on the balcony or you could walk out on the seashore and say, calm down. Now, any of us could do that, couldn't we? <laughs> we could walk out there and say, calm down. <clears throat> but when you can walk out there and say, be still, calm down, and it settles and calms down, can you imagine but then as we were talking about back here at the table last week and looking at those pictures, here's earth, here's the sun, here's the moon, here's the, and it gets so much bigger that the earth just disappears, and that's just inside our galaxy. And then you think, how many of those are out, and how big? So for, for the Son of God to be able to get up in a boat when people think they're going to drown, okay, be still, be calm. Not to the people, maybe to them too, eventually, but he takes care of the situation, doesn't he? 
Enough so that they're even looking at each other going, oh my goodness. Man, I can't, I mean, we know it and we can imagine it, but yeah, it's still. And then his words to them, once that was done, where is your faith? Now, I pondered that question too. He gets up, calms the sea, calms the wind, and asks these disciples, where is your faith? Now, was that an expect an answer kind of question where he looks at them and goes, where is your faith? Or is it more of calming the, calming the sea, calming the wind, and then walking away, where is your faith? You know, that kind of casual asking himself more than them. Where is your faith? We don't know that. This is Luke's writing. Luke can tell us one day. Jesus can tell us one day if we're interested to know. Where is your faith? Now, the next line makes it, easy, makes it easier to imagine the latter. Because it says, who is this? He commands even the winds and the water, and they obey him. So there wasn't, and again, this is Luke's writing. He could have recorded, Jesus asked a question, so-and-so said this, so-and-so said that. But the next line is, who is like this? In fear and amazement, they ask one another, who is this? Who is this? Maybe they already knew. Maybe this demonstration, maybe in their fear and in their sudden relief, who is this? It's kind of like the modern day, who does that? Who does that? Who's able to say to the raging water and the wind, be still? Who does that? Certainly a teaching moment. It's not the first. It's not the first teaching moment by any stretch of the imagination and definitely not the last. From Deuteronomy to Hebrews, there's something that is reinforced, and it's reinforced one of the most powerful times is when Joshua had to step into Moses' role. This reinforcement of the promise, I will never leave you or forsake you. I will, from Deuteronomy to Hebrews, and other instances where it doesn't use those exact words, but we know that it's there. I will not leave you comfortless is one that comes to mind. I will not leave you or forsake you. Now, brethren, he may not be here with us physically as he was here with these disciples in this boat. We can't go to him and shake him and touch him and feel him. Well, we can feel him, but not in a physical touching flesh to flesh, right? He may not be here with us in the physical flesh as he was here with these disciples. But you and I still get those teaching or those teachable moments, don't we? We still do. He's still with us because he said, I will not leave you or forsake you. And it talks about God. And then, of course, Jesus reemphasizes that of his own self and of the Holy Spirit. But we still get those teachable moments. He still may ask, where is your faith? Where is your faith? When you get nervous, when you get upset, when you get stressed out, where is your faith? John chapter 2, I'm going to pick up a couple of verses in John chapter 2. As soon as I can get there. John chapter 2 and verse 13. You may already be ahead of me, especially when we're thinking about the topic or the, the, the subject of tough love. John 2, 13, when it was almost time for the Jewish Passover, Jesus went up to Jerusalem. In the temple courts, he found people selling cattle, sheep and doves, and others sitting at tables exchanging money. So what did he do? He made a whip out of cords and drove all from the temple courts, both sheep and cattle. He scattered the coins of the money changers and overturned the tables. Well, there it is, right? There it is. This is tough. This is tough. Guys love this, and probably some gals too. Man, this is, this is old west. This is rough and tumble. I mean, that's tough. Seeing some action here. Yeah, 
Roadhouse Bible story. This is how it's done. You take care of business. Get this stuff out of here. Got a whip of cords and turning over tables and all kinds of chaos taking place. This is tough. Righteous judgment. Righteous judgment. Oh, yeah. Yes. But we that's one of the reasons why we like it, right? This this justice, this righteous judgment. Send the sinner scurrying. Justice. It's exactly what you received, right? Back in the day. It's exactly what you received. Justice. <laughs> no. How about no? We, it's funny, it, it, we're, as humans we're funny. Now sometimes we're in a, in, a, in a good tight place in our journey and with our, in our spiritual journey. And maybe we don't like this kind of stuff as good, but sometimes we're, we're, we've got a little anger and some hostility and some pent-up frustration and we see Jesus had it too. He went in here and boy, he cleaned house. There it is. But we, we are funny because... Too often it seems to me that we want to receive mercy but deliver justice. Oh, I need mercy, but you need justice. You need to get what's yours. You need to be what you need to get what's coming to you. Now, brethren, I can't say. All I can do is read it as it's recorded for me, and I can speculate and I can think on it, but I can't say what all played into lighting this fuse this day. I know the main ingredient. I know the main ingredient. It was respect and honor for the Father. You know, Hosea, Matthew, different places. We read, I desire mercy and not sacrifice. It's recorded in Hosea. It's repeated in Matthew. I desire mercy and not sacrifice. And actually we are charged in Matthew 9.13. But go and learn what this means. Matthew 9.13. But go and learn what this means. I desire mercy, not sacrifice. You know the next sentence? For I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners. Not come to call the righteous, but sinners. Is that justice or is that mercy? We believe that we received mercy. And sometimes we like to see justice delivered. We don't want to be partakers or receivers of justice necessarily. Unless we're in a court of law and we don't know if we can even get that in a court of law anymore. I have not come to call right, the righteous, but I've come to call sinners. Now, hearkening back to John chapter 2 when this fuse was lit, when this uh, frustration, it seems, and who knows if it was out of frustration or if it was just simply that respect and honor for the Father. Look what's taking place in here. This is the temple. You can't be doing this stuff in here. Who knows? If, I don't know that there was really frustration because it tells us Christ was angry but didn't sin. Well, that's our target anyway, is to not sin when we're angry. We simply don't know all the results of this episode in John chapter 2. Right? It says that he came in, he made the whip of cords, and he overturned the money. He ran out the sheep and the cattle and the doves and everything else and, and, and overturned the, the tables. But we don't know that every person there just went running and never thought about it, never heard any of the other words he had to say that day. We simply don't know all the results of this episode. If we read, if we read... Uh, read down to verse 15, scattered the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. Verse 16 says, to those, this is, some, this is some interaction. It's not just going in and wreaking havoc. To those who sold doves, he said, get these out of here. Stop turning my father's house into a market. Now, there's plenty of things taking place in that statement. My father, which means I'm his son. This is his temple. This is the honor and respect that you're supposed to have for the Father. 
Get it out of here. Stop turning my father's house into a market. His disciples, again, here's a result. His disciples remembered that it is written, zeal for your house will consume me. How many times do we, how many times do we quote that scripture? How many times do we get excited? How many times do we get emotional about that scripture? Zeal for your house will consume me. Well, of course we had Jews there that wanted to respond. <laughs> He's made these comments, right? He's went in. Don't turn my father's house into this place. You can't do this here. And the Jews then responded to him, What sign can you show us? Mr. Man, what sign can you show us to prove your authority to do all this? Who are you coming in? Who does this? Who does this? What are you doing? Do you know who we are? Give us some sign. Give us so you need to prove you need to show your credentials. Well, what did Jesus say? Destroy this temple. Jesus answered them, destroy this temple, and I will raise it again in three days. <clears throat> the heck you say? It has taken us 46 years to build this temple, they said. And you're going to raise it in three days? We weren't getting the picture, were they? But the temple he had spoken of was his body. After he was raised from the dead, again, results. After he was raised from the dead, his disciples recalled what he had said. Would they have believed? Because the next words are, then they believed the scripture and the words that Jesus had spoken. Would they have believed if he hadn't shown them this example? If he hadn't went in there in front of his disciples and overturned the money changers and, and created this chaos in the temple because of what was taking place there? Was it for his disciples to later believe and understand? He goes before us and comes behind us, doesn't he? There's reason in what he does. It wasn't just John Wayne chewed him up, you know, I'm going to show my manhood here. I'm going to overturn some stuff and kick people around so they can see there's some authority here. After they remembered, the disciples recalled, and then they believed the scripture and the words that Jesus had spoken. Now while he was in Jerusalem at the Passover, while he was in Jerusalem at the Passover festival, many people saw the signs. He was performing and believed in his name. But Jesus would not entrust himself to them. Why? For he knew all people. He did not need any testimony about mankind. For he knew what was in each person. Wow. I do think, I do think, brethren, and others stated it as much last week, that the Holy Spirit that we take an earnest of when we are baptized, hands are laid on us, and we receive, we receive the Holy Spirit. And we hopefully nurture that, grow that, but the Holy Spirit does bend us towards benevolence. I believe the Holy Spirit within us bends us towards benevolence. In other words, gives us this eagerness or this desire, anyway, to do kindness. I think that's our first instinct. I'm walking under the Christian banner. Whatever situation I'm in, my first impulse should be to do kindness. Now, sometimes we fall out of that first impulse, don't we? Maybe our feelings get hurt. Maybe our toes, toes get stepped on. Whatever it is, maybe we're just in a bad mood. And that first impulse, that benevolence, that eagerness or desire to do kindness kind of gets kicked to the side. I know what I'm supposed to do, but this is what I'm going to do. There you go. And the phone rings. But anyway, sometimes, we, and we know that. We've, we've, we, you know, we've beaten that horse, how we, we go outside the boundary sometimes. But then we have to repent, we have to do whatever, and we have to come back, right? So I do believe the Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit bends us towards that desire to do kindness. I have to believe that. I have to believe that about the Holy Spirit. To have, to have faith, I guess, to get through. I have to believe that we are 
bent towards benevolence. We are bent towards kindness. Not that we always follow through with it. Now, something else, that Holy Spirit, perhaps it can also ignite a fire at times. Right? And that's good. It can be, excuse me, it can be good. Let God be the judge. But my personal opinion, it cannot be because someone isn't obeying. It can't be because you aren't obeying or because you're sinning. You know, that where our fire gets, oh my goodness, something's got to happen here. And too often, hopefully not in this group, there's the, the fairness issue. I have to do this, so you should have to do that too. You should have to be doing this too. I have to keep the holy days. I have to abstain from, from unclean meats. I have to go to the church on the Sabbath. I have to do this. After you, so you should be doing it too. That should never be the thing that lights the fire in us. Just like Jesus, when he overturned and, and had this chaotic moment in John chapter 2, when it comes to, if that fire in us is because of the honor and respect of the Father, that's a different story. One concept. One concept of tough love. Or one concept is sometimes tough love. Tough love starts out as benevolence, right? Tough love starts out as the willingness, the eagerness, or the desire to do kindness. Starts out that way. Depending on the response, though, or how long it takes, how long you've been trying, how long you've been having this desire to do kindness, and then the response that comes, okay, you know, it can become that, uh, it may eventually, even though it started out as benevolence, it may eventually reach that okay moment. Okay. Okay, I've tried, for however long it's been, I've tried to help. That's fair. That's fair. You know, we watched a thing yesterday, I think it was 40 minutes, Lead Me Home, I think was the name of it. And I saw them. I mean, we all see homeless people, right? And depending on where you are, like when we were in California, San Francisco, Santa Clara area a couple years ago, I saw the tent cities. But not, no, I wasn't in the heart of the city where I saw it like we saw it on this, on this documentary. But I did see it out on some of the freeways and where the... Where the, the highways divide and there's a big grassy area with trees and it would just be filled with tents and trash and and you you drive by it and you it's gone it's in your rear view you don't think about it maybe you do you don't think about it for a long time and then you have you know 40 minutes to look at it and think about it and you're judgmental you think some of those people are there because they've made bad choices, but then there's plenty of them that are there because, and the hopelessness. My goodness, the hopelessness is the hardest thing to look at. It's hard to look at. And you want to think, if I could just, if I could just, again, I think the Holy Spirit, and this is not, this is not tooting my horn because I don't have a horn to toot. Sometimes even the worst of us have decent thoughts. You think, man, if I could just. And there's, there's thousands of people out there that are trying to make a dent, trying to help. And some people you can't help. And my, my whole point is you come to the point of thinking, and Karina and I have had this conversation many times about having a place where people could come to. And they're, they pay for their room and board by helping raise food, by helping keep the place up, by helping, you know, and, and you've only got a limited amount of time, and if you can't get with the program, you got to go. But if you can get with the program, you've got a place to stay. You don't have to be living under a bridge or, you know. But ultimately you come to the, 
I don't know if it could even, I don't know if it would matter. I don't know if you could help. And that's what I mean by you have a length of time where you, it starts out as benevolence, but after a while it would come to that point to where, you know, it's tough love time. I don't want you to have to sleep in your car. I don't want you to have to sleep under a bridge. I don't, have to, I don't want you to have to sleep in a little tent, a little nylon tent when it's 12 degrees outside. But you've got to have some responsibility somewhere, right? So it depends on the response. Okay, I've tried to help. And that's fair. It happens. It's not like forgiveness. What does the scripture tell us about forgiveness? How many times should we forgive a person? Maybe even for doing the same thing to me. To me. They're doing this thing to me. Seven times? Lord, should I, should I forgive? I, seven times. And we know the response. I say unto you, not seven times, but until 70 <laughs> times seven. And we know that that's a finite number. It's not 490, it's, or whatever that turns out to be. 70 times 7. But anyway, I wasn't up here to give a math lesson, okay? It's, it's as, many times as, it, as many times as it happens. And I don't know that that's true of benevolence. It's, you, you never give up on being benevolent, but I'm saying with one, with one person or one group, how long does it take before you have to you do have to exercise or administer some tough love. It happens. Sometimes, even with us, Christ could say, uh, Freddie, I'm going to be I'm going to be right here. I'm going to be right here. Because he's not, he's not forsaking the promise of I'll never leave you or forsake you. I'm going to be right here. You know where to find me? Right here. But you're going to have to figure this out. You're going to have to figure it out. I'm going to be right here, but you've got to figure some things out. There is the promise, I will never leave you or forsake you. And that's not forsaking. Because sometimes when our benevolence becomes tough love, it's not that you're on your own, forget about it. I'm here to support you, but you're going to have to, you're going to, have to contribute. A misconception on my part, brethren, at times anyway, is that tough love is that tough love is the opposite of benevolence. That tough love, and maybe it's one of the things that makes me recoil. Not always, but sometimes when I hear that expression, tough love, it makes me, ooh, there's that phrase. Is that I, in error, maybe in those times think that tough love is the opposite of benevolence benevolence, that desire to do goodness or to do kindness. I have to change my way of thinking about tough love in some ways. We may praise the administering of it, tough love, especially in the right situations. We may praise the administer, the administering of tough love, not so much the receiving. For us to receive tough love is a different story, right? Maybe in hindsight, maybe in hindsight we can appreciate it and think, yeah, I know why you did that. I know why my parents did this. I know why my grandparents did that. I know why the law officer did this or the whoever. Whoever's given me that tough love, whoever's administering, maybe in hindsight we can appreciate it. Tough love may be that okay moment sometimes. <clears throat> that okay moment but not always many years ago at the place of the skull Golgotha's Hill Calvary whatever you want to refer to it as many years ago on that hill, these words were heard. Eloi. Eloi. Lemma Sabachthani. Tough love? I don't mean on the part of God. 
Because we said it back here. It's cliche. But we know that it wasn't the spikes that held him to that instrument of murder. Because he could have brought himself down. Was even mocked to do so. Oh, he can save everybody else himself he cannot save. Truth? <laughs> could he have come down? But he didn't. This gives you a... This flips tough love on its head, doesn't it? Tough love? Times a million. Administered that day. That was tough love that held him there. And he cried out. It was administered. Reception doesn't feel so bad. Now does it? We take that tough love every day. We take it every day. And we're benefactors every day. Blessed be the name of the Lord forever.